Eliza Blue, um, and she is a folk musician, writer, uh, environmental advocate, and rancher residing in one of the most remote counties in the contiguous United States, which is Perkins County. Um, she writes weekly column about rural life, Little Pasture on the Prairie, that is carried by 17 different print publications, writes and produces seasonal audio postcards from her ranch for, from her ranch for South Dakota Public Broadcasting and Prairie Public Radio, and released her first book, Accidental Rancher, in 2020. Her writing on rural life has also been featured in New York Times, The Guardian, and she's a regular columnist for The Daily Yonder, a national publication for and about rural people. Blue's latest project, a traveling concert television show for PBS that celebrates rural culture and arts called Wish You Were Here with Eliza Blue was recently nominated for a Midwest Emmy and is now filming its third season. So we have a multi-talented uh, Miss Blue here. Um, let's welcome her with a round of applause and I'll just hand over this microphone to you, Miss Blue. I'm gonna start out by playing you a song because I'm a lot more comfortable with the guitar than I am with PowerPoint. <laughs> I was just saying the part about this that made me the most nervous was having the clicker to click through the slides, so. I spend my day like a hole in hay, hey now, hey now. I spend my day like a hole in hay, hey now, hey now. I drive the horses till the day is done, hey now, hey now, till the day is done. is hard, it's a heavy load, hey now, hey now, work is hard, it's a heavy load, hey now, hey now, count the hours till the day is done, hey now, hey now, till the day is done, hey, hey, the day is done. is hot and the creek is dry hey now hey now weather's hot the creek is dry hey now hey now but jenny is waiting on the other side hey now hey now the day is done and the day is done So my name is Eliza Blue, and that song I wrote probably 14, 15 years ago, long before I really even knew what hay was. <laughs> I'd listened to a lot of folk songs, though, so I had some good ideas about agriculture that came mostly from old folk tunes and from um, reading uh, Little House on the Prairie books when I was a kid. And that was about all I knew. So I grew up in cities, I grew up in suburbs, I drove through the prairie on my way to get to my next gig, and I didn't know anything, anything, anything. Well, then, at, by some very strange twist of fate, I ended up in Perkins County, South Dakota. It was meant to be a temporary adventure. I was, I'd been working as a touring singer-songwriter, playing in other people's bands, um, just all over the country, Europe, and I was really burnt out. So uh, I decided I was going to go the complete opposite direction um, and move to this incredibly rural county, Perkins County, South Dakota. Um, our big joke there is that we are the furthest from a McDonald's of anywhere in the entire contiguous United States, which is pretty impressive. Um, so we're, it's, our population density is one person per square mile. Uh, cattle outnumber us three to one. So, so yeah, there's a lot of, 
There's a lot of uh, livestock and grass and not very many humans. So when I first moved to Perkins County, I thought I was just going to stay, experiment with, or just have the experience of rural life, uh, you know, like get in tune with the land and then go back to my urban life. Um, and one of the first things that happened is I took in some bum lambs. Um, I was teaching at the local high school, but I made friends with a rancher. Uh, when spring came, <clears throat> she had bum lambs. And I, the, from the second I stepped into the lambing barn, I, it was like getting hit by a truck. I just was overwhelmed by this feeling that like this is where I was meant to be. And I, I've never had anything like that happen to me before or since of just this deep knowing, like something about this is for me. Um, so she had all these bum lambs. I offered to take a couple because I wanted to have the experience of bottle feeding the babies, and then I was going to give them back. Well, that didn't happen. Instead, <laughs> the lambs became part of my family. And um, at this time, I also was had met another rancher, and eventually we fell in love, got married. We now have two kids, and I now live on the ranch that is uh, has been in his gener or in his family for four generations. So his great grandparents um, were the original homesteaders on the piece of property that we still where we still live and work. <clears throat> so it's a very interesting juxtaposition to be uh, a former urbanite, um, an artist now living in the place that I do, doing the work that I do. Um, and I often feel, I mean, one of the ma main questions I get when I sort of introduce myself as these two different things is like, how did that happen? <laughs> um, and it's hard, it's, it, it continues to be an interesting experience to try to make those two pieces work together. Um, and it feels kind of like it's my life's work. So interesting, like just again, as a little tiny bit of background, I read The Omnivore's Dilemma long before I made it to South Dakota. Um, and if you are familiar with that book, they specifically, or uh, the author <clears throat> specifically goes to Vail, South Dakota, which is not very far from here, um, and in interviews um, somebody who's at the beginning of this, a rancher who's at the beginning of the supply chain of the industrial agriculture model of, of beef production. So anyway, having ha read that whole book, I, um, I was already vegetarian before I read it. That sort of solidified that that was the proper <laughs> route for me. So you can imagine, again, my, the, <laughs> the cognitive dissonance that occurred when I then moved to this very rural place where the main industry is um, raising cows for meat, or cows and cattle for meat. Well, what I have learned, I mean, I, I've already written one book and I could write many more about the distance between what I thought I knew and the realities of our life and lifestyle. Um, and by that, I think, <clears throat> I don't know how, how many of you guys actually grew up on ranches or farms. Is there a lot of, all right, so, so it looks like I am preaching to the choir here and that we know that, that obviously there's ways that we can keep improving our methodology, but when it comes to cattle production on the grasslands, this is um, when done correctly, and again, I know you all know this, when using a regenerative model, this is a way to actually create soil health um, and to create a, a biodiversity within this ecosystem. Um, so it's been, again, an interesting journey for me and a journey that I will presumably be on for the rest of my life because I don't think uh, it's not, that there's no destination. There's always more learning to do um, and more growing to do literally and figuratively. So, um, but the purposes of this talk are actually related to a grant I got early, um, or I got early last year. And it's, it's gonna take place over two years. And this is what the grant was for. It is to create an artisan in residence program for short and long-term residencies. The selection of artisans will focus on craftspeople whose source materials are readily available in our region with an educational component that will benefit the whole community. So, that was the plan. <laughs> and here, why artisans? Why did I think that would be a good idea for our community? Well, <clears throat> I'm going to back up so I can read this better. So last year, um, I had, or from 2020 to 2021, I was working for the South Dakota Arts Council. 
And the reason I was selected to do that work is because um, we obviously have some really great arts happening in our state, but they are by and large, um, they are happening in our are more urban areas, which is the case, you know, pretty much any state. And obviously we're a state that is predominantly ag agricultural. So they were really hoping to get my, um, to get me to go out into my rural community and get more of a sense of what they could be doing to support art and artists in rural places. So I've included a little quote up here. This, it, it, is anybody familiar with Springboard for the Arts? It's an amazing organization that supports grassroots um, art and artists. It's artist-centric, um, and it's, it's just a very cool organization. They're based in St. Paul, but they do a lot of work with rural art and artists um, across the country and specifically in the upper Midwest. So they, this is based on their research. Research on creative placemaking and creative community development has demonstrated that there is great impact from arts, projects, and programs across almost all sectors of the community. Economic impact studies of the arts have proved that art activity is a valuable asset to cities and neighborhoods. Well, I think it's funny that they even say cities and neighborhoods because, again, where I live, it's mostly grass. Um, but when I went out into my community, you know, trying to find out what could be done to support art and artists, um, Inevitably, I would, you know, I would say like, well, what do you, what would you look for an arts organization, or what would you like to see being done by the arts council? And inevitably, the com the conversation would immediately turn to economic development, and that any any kind of arts initiative in our rural communities has to take that into account. I guess I would say that's my bottom line, because the idea of rebuilding main streets, I mean, that's the top of mind for almost any rural person and looking at trying to figure out ways to keep any materials in our communities, um, resources in our communities, because they, I mean, they've been bleeding out for two, two generations. So again, I know you all already know that. So what I was hoping is that we could create these artisan in residence programs for two different, with two different goals in mind. Oh, and here, I guess I'll read this part too. We have an economic advantage in our rural communities because the agricultural products that are already being produced there, we don't have to ship them anywhere. They don't have to go, they're there already. And in fact, it's, you know, again, one of the mysteries of capitalism and the supply chain that things leaving the place they're made is somehow economically ma makes more sense than keeping it in the home community. It's very strange. But so if operators can find unique and regionally specific methods to brand what they are already producing, by adding value in any myriad of ways, we could see a fundamental shift in our local economies. So again, I, I feel like you guys all probably already know this. <laughs> this is things that you'd be well versed in. So, but my goal was twofold. We're looking at agritourism. And again, um, we are very, very rural. So a lot of models for agritourism just don't make sense to my neighbors because it's not like there's a city 45 minutes away with a huge population. Our closest city would be Rapid City, which isn't even you know particularly large if you compare it to a lot of other urban centers. And that's two and a half hours away. The, uh, the next closest city is Bismarck, and that's three hours away. So to people where I live, they just don't see that they are going to be able to bring tourists in. They don't appreciate, like, they, they just don't see that that would be something that would work for us where we live. So part of my idea was to prove that wrong, to show that, you know what, in this day and age, people are really starting to value experiences more than products in a way that's kind of new, generationally new, that's especially true for younger people. And what we offer with our remoteness is actually a unique experience, and that's actually an asset and doesn't have to be a deterrent to agritourism. So that was my very first goal, was just to show if we could create workshops, classes, retreat-type experiences, then those, that would just, I would be able to say, no, you can do it, see, we, we did it and worked. And similarly, I wanted to bring in the actual artists into our community, and as I say here, it, that way other business owners would have the opportunity to bump into these creative solutions and innovative strategies for problem solving that inevitably, you know, artists and artisans, that's what they're bringing. They're bringing their unique way of creating, and that mindset I thought would be really helpful in our communities. And the other one is what I already talked about, just the simple supply chain, which is that the more we can keep products 
um, being produced in the places that they are being produced or close to that place, the better for the, you know, the environment because we don't have the fossil fuels of shipping things all over, and again, better for the communities. So, uh, as the last line says here, an artisan in residence program is an opportunity to jumpstart the conversation around some of these big ideas while also creating practical hands-on instruction as to what that kind of shift could look like. So, any questions so far? <laughs> no? Pretty good? All right. So, the first offering was this past summer. It was a fiber retreat with fiber artist Kelly Nispel. Do we have any fiber enthusiasts in the crowd by any chance? Do you happen to know Kelly by any chance? I was going to say, she's kind of a rock star in the fiber community. So if you um, are into fiber arts at all, you, you probably know Kelly. So she has, um, she's just a perfect example of what I'm talking about. So she lives right outside Aberdeen, um, South Dakota. She has a mill, um, a small mill where she does custom carding. So she has a lot of connections to producers, small-scale producers already in our state, and people who um, just love the fiber arts. Um, so in addition, so you, you can send her your raw wool. That's actually how I met her. Um, you can send her your raw wool, and she will send you back um, carded wool that can then be hand spun or used in felting. Um, so that's her main job, but she also teaches. She's an amazing fiber artist in her own right. She also raises um, sheep and those are, that. This, this is actually from her, I just pulled it from her website to kind of give you an idea of some of the things that she offers and that's her little flock right there. So, <clears throat> and it, this was kind of a safe way to start because I knew she had a built-in crowd of people that would be excited to work with her. Again, I was a little bit going out on a limb because I I believed that people would travel to get a chance to work with her, but I didn't know it for sure. <laughs> so there was a little trepidation there thinking, are we actually going to be able to get people to drive and come stay on our ranch? Because um, she's, she's worth it. She's really cool, but I just wasn't sure. So anyway, the other part that we built into the grant is related to what I was saying before. It was important to me that we not just be bringing people in using that agritourism model where we would have, you know, the, the urban dwellers who would come in and bring their money and, and buy things and be part of our community for the retreat weekend. But it was also important to me that we introduce the community to the project um, in a sort of organic way. So. Part of what I wrote into the grant was her coming and staying um, for longer than just the retreat and uh, giving some, offering some community um, demonstrations and workshops as well. So here she is at our public library. And again, I wasn't sure if anyone was going to show up. I mean, our town is tiny. I can't overemphasize that. And so we always joke when we offer any kind of an arts offering or, um, or anything that might be a little bit, like if it's not a sporting event that kids are involved in or like the choir concert. Um, the, it's always a little scary. Is anyone going to come at all? But we say, you know, if five people come, that's like 10% um, of our population, which means that if we were offering this in Sioux Falls, it's like we just got hundreds of thousands of people. Just kidding, not really. But that, that we, we, have to, we have to measure our success differently. So five people is actually a lot of people. Anyway, we got more than five, though. So I was very, very pleased. And as you can see, um, it was a wide range. We had some very young people that came. We had some older people that came. Uh, almost everybody who came, though, and this is what was surprising to me, had no experience with the fiber arts. Um, and so we had a couple of people who have spent their life uh, raising sheep and didn't know anything about the sheep to sweater process and were excited to learn. So I was very gratified that everything I had hoped we could accomplish, we did. So as you can see, she had a table with different types of um, like different samples of wool and kind of explained what different types of wool could be used for, um, showed her carded fleeces, went through the whole process of what it takes to go from a raw fleece then to carded fleece, and then um, also did a spinning demonstration. And as you can see, interactive, so fun. Um, she actually got some people to come up and try out her spinning wheel, and it was just a great, it was a great experience. I was so ah, pleased that it went as well as it did. Um, so that was part one. Uh, the next part was the actual retreat. 
And I had set, um, honestly, I'd set, again, my, my standards were pretty, or my, my goals were pretty low. I was like, this is our first offering of this kind. Another part of doing this, what I needed to prove to myself and, again, to my neighbors, is that you don't have to have, like, an actual retreat center to hold an offering like this. So we, I mean, our ranch is not, like, an Instagram-friendly ranch. It's very ranchy like there's a lot of poop like I've got dogs that drag things from the from way out in the pasture into the yard I mean like it's my mom who has never lived anywhere other than cities when she comes to visit like she gets a little overwhelmed like (laughs) she's like "Ah, ah," walking through our yard because I mean there's like I said there's a lot of poop and bones and and things like that and especially in the summer there's flies um so we held it in our literal, like, this is my yard. (laughs) We set up tables in the yard. Um, I had offered that people could, there are accommodations in our town, but I offered that people could camp on our land if they wanted to, and we had some people that did take us up on that offer. Um, But I also was very upfront, like, it's an outhouse situation here. And so I just said that from the beginning, like this is, this is rustic, this is rough. If that's your scene, like this is for you. If it's not, then this is not for you. And so again, I had capped it at 10, wasn't sure we'd get there. And we did like almost instantly. It was kind of crazy. I, all I did, I had thought I was gonna do kind of more of a rollout and t- you know attract people. All I did was put something on Facebook Fiber artist Kelly Nispel's coming for a retreat. Here are the details. If you want to, this is the Eventbrite link. And like within two days, I had 10 people signed up, which was awesome. The only downside of that is that then I had people reaching out wanting to be part of it. And I was like, it's already full. <laughs> we'll offer another one, um, you know, in the future, but sorry. Um, so, and similarly, when we did the workshop in town, which, you know, Kelly was already there, the people that had come had, had fun and were wondering if they could then come to the retreat. And it was like, we, uh, you know, I, I kind of opened it up like, you can come if you want, but we don't have enough, you know, we already ordered all the supplies and things. So it would be more, you'd, you'd get to just kind of hang out, I guess, which... We'll go to the next. Oh, actually, maybe I should talk about these. So the sheep to shawl concept, um, this is just a phrase that's thrown around with fiber art community um, events, is that you can take some like a raw fleece and go all the way to you know yarn that you'd then be able to knit into whatever you want. They just say sheep to shawl because it sounds cool. Um, so you can see on the table, this is a raw fleece from, from my flock. Um, So we took that raw fleece, we washed it, um, and here you can see, ooh, I've got my little pointer. Is that going to work? Nope. All right, there we go. So there she is. I don't know if you can see it in the picture, but she's actually using a drop spindle there. So participants were taught how to use a drop spindle. Um, She also did some workshopping on, like, the more traditional spinning wheel, because we did have some people that came that were more experienced spinners. Um, and then over here, you can see there, again, there's the drop spindle with, this, with yarn that um, was created from them. This is what it looks like after it's been washed. And then this is a carding tool right there. That is what kind of pulls the wool apart. So when, you, when it's raw, um, it, it's kind of clumped together it, in these, like, we call them locks. So, so that was the process she, she was walking us through as part of the retreat. The other part of the retreat was we did natural dyeing and sort of same concept. She brought, we've got here, I, calendula that I grew in my garden and marigold, which is a great plant, natural plant dye. We also had, um, I don't know if you guys recognize, oh, she was in the last picture, but now I don't see her. But Trish Jenkins actually was one of the participants in the retreat who is holding a workshop after this. Um, She's from Cycle Farms. Anyway, she had brought walnuts from her, from Cycle Farms, that had just fallen on the ground. It was like all the walnuts she collected from the ground. So that was another thing we used for the dye pot. This actually here, this orange that they're pulling out, that is what we got from the calendula. Um, and the, the walnut, on the other hand, makes them a brown dye as kind of what the color you'd kind of expect. Um, and then finally we did... <clears throat> She also offered felting, which I really like um, felting as an entry. It's kind of like the gateway drug to fiber arts because it's you can you can use even raw wool if you want to. You can use just carded wool. It's very straightforward and it's a lot of fun. So you can see we've got you just need water bottles and soap basically, and you can use. And so Kelly had brought different samples of naturally dyed wool um, and carded wool from her 
from her uh, from her mill. And then over here, we've got some finished project projects, which I think turned out so so fun. Um, and oh yeah, I think of the next picture. All right, and then ha, most importantly, the multi generational skills sharing. Um, so th this was absolutely the best part of this whole experience for me. This is what happened at the very beginning. Like I was still running around kind of getting set, st stuff set up and we had some people that, we had one person that was pretty late and you know, there was just different things that were happening and I was kind of trying to be the administrator, keeping everything smooth and moving forward and whatnot. Um, and these, all these folks that had shown up, they just set up their spinning wheels and just started hanging out and chatting and most of them had never met before. And it was just so cool because right away, I mean, there was a camaraderie, of course, that developed. And so there's everyone just sitting in my yard <laughs> with spinning wheels. It really was one of those moments you're like, it's happening, it's happening. <laughs> um, so meanwhile, Kelly had also brought this loom that, um, with the idea that sort of as we were going through these different, um, making these different projects and learning these different skills, um, people could also come over and just keep adding to the loom as as we as we went through the retreat so she had you know again odds and ends like little ends of, of like right here you can see that that's actually raw wool that we put the locks through and then people had brought projects with them and brought things with them so they also contributed to make by the end this weaving that um, was kind of like little pieces of the whole workshop and also what people had brought from their home communities um, and then this is my daughter and her friend who like super got into it so I again like it was my dream come true because part of why I also, like my secret goal <laughs> is by sort of normalizing these type of activities for young people, it's like they're just gonna grow up like, yeah, this is what we do. We just hang out in our yard and spin yarn with people. Like it's not weird to do that. Um, and so again, it was like, it's working. Here they are doing it. So, and then this is my final slide here. That's the finished, you can see over there, there's our finished weaving. Um, this is the skeins of yarn, those were the samples. Oh, and part of it too is that we were able to send everybody home They with samples of, <coughs> of skeins of dyed yarn. Um, <coughs> with, uh, for, for some of the participants, if they didn't already own a drop spindle, we provided them a drop spindle, um, like in here, so, and this was, kind of a group photo here. You can see in the background, we've got our skeins drying. Um, so yeah, it was really, really fun and really, really amazing. Ah, <sighs> but, all right, so that's the, that was the happy part. Now we're gonna get down to the brass tacks. <laughs> so the reality is, one thing that I didn't think of, how could I have not thought of this? It's July in the middle of the prairie, and it just so happened that that weekend was the hottest weekend we had all summer. So it was over 100 degrees. Um, so you can see, I'm like, everyone looks pretty happy, but like we were all super hot. And um, like leading up to it, as I realized that was going to be the weather, that was like the biggest stressor. Because I had planned what would happen if we needed to be inside. Like I was like, oh, I've got this big canopy. And like I had plans for what would need to happen if it rained. Um, hello. It never rains in Western South Dakota in July. Um, I did not think about heat. So it was very hot. And that was, you know, again, in retrospect, um, we would probably hold it earlier in the summer. <laughs> Uh, so, and hopefully avoid those kind of temperatures. We did get extension cords out and had fans like on us. Um, and for the most part, and that's this group is a little smaller because this was at the end of the retreat and we did lose a couple people on the second day because the second day was even hotter and they were like, we, we can't do it. So, so that was the, the like, ooh, okay, good. Duly noted, doing it midsummer, not a great idea. The other part that I wouldn't say was a failure but was definitely part of the learning curve is I wanted to offer this on a donation basis because again, I wasn't really sure, you know, from a from a marketplace capitalist perspective like how much would somebody be willing to pay for a retreat like this? I had no idea. Like there there's just no way I could make a guess because I don't know any other offerings that are quite like this in our region. And, um, and I also wanted it to be something that members of our community could afford to do. Um, so I feel like the prices that maybe an urban person would be willing to pay would be different than the prices that someone in our home community might think were reasonable. Um, 
So rather than like, I mean, there's, there, I thought about doing sort of like a sliding scale. I, I like that model. But in the end, I was like, we've got this grant. Let's just see if we can do it all in donation. And I told people <clears throat> sort of like, this is the cost per person that, it, you know, to bring Kelly to get these supplies. So just to kind of see. Would, would we be able, and, and I also said, if we can make back the equivalent of what this costs to put on, then next year, when I don't have a grant, I can also offer it on a donation basis, and we can just keep paying it forward like that. Sadly, we did not get up to the dollar amount that it cost us to put on. So I definitely in the future would have to, um, I, think the, I think probably what we would end up doing is having um, the supplies be something you had to purchase um, and maybe the, the retreat itself be something that um, you, could, you could do a sliding scale donation um, and be a little bit more overt about you know, again, I told people what it cost, but say, like, you really have to pay this much if you want to do it um, for us to be able to keep holding them. Um, <clears throat> so that was kind of the caveat related to uh, the financial part of it. Um, now, again, from an infrastructure, oh my gosh, time is going really fast. From an infrastructure perspective, like I said, my dream continues to be to, you know, have these events going forward to be able to offer them, you know, Obviously, I'm, I'm a touring singer-songwriter and a writer, and we run a ranch. We don't have a ton of time to, to like set up a retreat center and hold these kind of events regularly. But again, part of what I wanted to prove is like you can do one or two of these a year. It's a, a great way to, to be advertising your products, whatever they may be, whether it's wool if you raise sheep, or I think there's so much potential in the local foods movement for bringing some, you know, having sort of a weekend retreat around food and products products that are, you know, raised by your ranch. Um, and, and, and I, again, I feel like you probably all know this and have thought of this, but what I wanted to show and what I'm now happy to share with you is that like you just, it doesn't have to be fancy for it to still be meaningful and for people to have a great experience. Um, it doesn't have to look like Instagram for it to still be a really, um, a really amazing experience that grows community. So that was my big takeaway um, and what I wanted to share with you. Um, and there was a couple other real quick things I was going to say, and then I'll open it up for questions. So I am in this process right now of working with some different artists on an artist collective that we're calling the Kithship Collective, an artist and artisans. And again, it's related to all of this work. Like, how can we create place-based art um, in our rural communities, how can we uh, create opportunities to share that work, whether it's a, you know, an actual product like a weaving or a song or a poem? How can we create more opportunities to share those in the places we are living and working? How can we create those connections with our neighbors? Um, and how can we then share that story with people who are not our neighbors, who live in these, these um, more urban settings? So I've been looking at a lot of different models of how to do this, um, and one route is, you know, a nonprofit creating a nonprofit. There's some reasons why that can be very challenging and difficult. Um, the other is an LLC, and so I was super inspired. These are my notes from listening to Hannah's talk. How many of you guys got to hear Hannah before? I was super inspired by this like worker-owned co-op model. I think that's really exciting. So I just wanted to like touch really quick on some things that she mentioned because I because I think they're worth saying again. Um, when we're looking at what it means to create these new systems, I mean, so we're talking about systems change is what it comes down to. And when we're looking at these traditional models, again, LLC versus nonprofit, with now this new worker-owned co-op, I could easily have named this talk Tending the Roots. And I would say that's true for all the work I'm doing. Because in the capitalist model that we currently have, where it's all about growth, Again, I know you all already know this. It's all about gro growth. What that means is we're looking at the leaves. We're looking at the fruit. We're completely forgetting about the roots. In, and that's literally true um, in a lot of agriculture models, but it's also true in arts models. It's true in nonprofit models. 
and what that means to me is the kind of burnout that Hannah was talking about. And again, anybody who's worked in these fields knows. Um, <laughs> another joke I always make is you don't think that like being a rancher and being a freelance artist would be similar, but they're incredibly similar because it all requires this kind of hustle and it requires this attention to like the fruit, um, but there's no infrastructure to support the roots at this point. And that's what we need to be thinking about and what we need to be building. So again, this grant was a wonderful opportunity because what I wanted to show, um, and by, by you know, getting the windfall of capital to do it without taking risk was hugely important because obviously we live on you know, tiny profit margins just like every other operator and you know, similar as a freelance musician. Yeah, it's, you don't go into that to make money. But what we were able to prove is that we could create a retreat experience that, that met all of these different goals and we could do it, quote unquote, sustainably, not just from the perspective of not using fossil fuels or um, you know, not using like a ton of fertilizer, but from the perspective of the human energy involved, that I could put this on without having to like, I mean, just do a ton of networking to have like a ton of different, you know, an online presence or this or this or that. I was able to create create this with relatively minimal effort with the setup we already have. Um, and I feel like that's what we need to be thinking about as we move forward, is not just how, how to create change, like the change we want to see, but to really be looking again at what Hannah was talking about with quality of life. And when we want to make those changes, the changes cannot come at the expense of like our human body and energy, we have to figure out how we can do them sustainably for our own selves as individuals and how we can bring in, you know, rest and how we can bring in joy and the the possibility of rejuvenation within the model. So I'm gonna leave you with that idea. If you have any questions specifically about the grant or in general, I'd be more than happy to answer. Um, I don't know what, if you wanna just yell them out. Okay, <laughs> all right. Just yell them out. What is the name of the collective? The Kith, all right, so Kith Ship Collective. It's spelled K-I-T-H and then ship. And it's related to, um, if you've ever heard the phrase of Kith and Kin, most people think of Kin and Kith as meaning the same thing, which is to say your relatives. But the distinction is that your Kin would be like your blood relatives, people you're related to genetically. Your Kith are the beings that you're related to um, based on place. So traditionally it would be like your neighbors. And I, my way of thinking about it is, you know, my neighbors are <laughs> not, there's not a lot of human neighbors. So my neighbors are uh, bugs and plants and animals. And so when I'm making the work that I make and doing the work I do, I'm doing it in, um, with connection and to build relationships with my kith, which is not just human beings. So that's where the, the name came from. Anybody else? <clears throat> oh, so in 2023, we are going to offer another workshop, um, and it's with uh, Sarah Miller, who actually is based outside of Rapid City. She's a bioregional herbalist. And what she's going to come and do is offer, um, the first part of the retreat will be a pasture walk where we go and do some different plant identification of different native plants. And she's going to talk about different ways you can use them. We're going to do some amount of collecting, although um, <laughs> since I learned my lesson, we're doing it earlier in the year. So there weren't, won't be as much available um, at that point. Uh, so, so we're going to use some dried herbs that I've collected and that she's collected um, and then offer some different body care, pro like teach tutorials on body care products and also some different herbal remedies that would all be from plants that are available in our bio region. And the same thing, she'll do some workshops at our library and then she will, um, then we'll hold the actual retreat on at the ranch. Yeah, that's her, that's her. Little Oak Apothecary is the, yeah, that's the name of um, <clears throat> her business. So yeah, she's pretty, she's pretty awesome. So I'm, I'm very excited. And again, hopefully we'll, we'll see, depending on Kelly's schedule, we may hold um, another uh, fiber retreat as well. Um, and this kind of goes back to, again, tending the roots. What I feel like I have learned um, in these years of working as a touring musician and now as a rancher, that I, I used to, when I was younger, I just wanted everything. I'd have these big ideas and I just like want to make it happen. And I've really learned like, you know what? 
you just have to start small, which is, you know, the title of the talk. Start small. Like, you can have the big dream, but every dream, like, to make it a reality, it has to be built on these very small steps. So not trying to overwhelm the system <laughs> by having the tree be so big that it just topples over at the first wind. Um, so on that note, would you guys like to hear one more song? We heard that this, this one st sometimes falls over, but that's why there's the. Oh my gosh, you guys, that's like the metaphor for the whole thing, right? It's so top heavy, it could just topple over, so we have to put a weight down there. <clears throat> All right, this is a song. Um, I often finish my shows with this song. Because <clears throat> um, I play uh, with uh, a singer-songwriter named Jamie Lynn who lives down in Spearfish. I, if you don't know her, she's another one to just check out. Um, but she, <laughs> we played some shows recently, um, and I finished with this too, and she was like, I think it's your best work. <laughs> um, which was meant a lot coming from her. But I wrote this song. We were going to, um, for the TV show I do for, for PBS, we were going to um, this church called the Stone Church. Um, it's on Standing Rock Reservation. It was built by congregants um, out of rock quarried from the, um, the creek. Or there's a cliff that goes down to a creek that's Fire Steel Creek that's right behind the church. And... Um, you know, that's a complicated legacy. <clears throat> and so without going into all the details of that, I felt like we were going to film there, um, and I wanted to write a song about it, but I felt like I, I just wasn't sure what to say. And um, this song feels like it informs, or it feels like a good way to describe, again, all the work I've been doing. Um, and the work of my life and maybe all of our lives, which is just to be in a process of discovery. Um, we don't have the answers. We don't have the answers. We'll never have the answers. And we also have very little control over the outcome. But if we can stay curious, if we can stay open, and if we can keep walking forward in love and working on building, again, just what Hannah said, building relationships, um, w moving at the speed of trust, I love that. And I think that's what this song is about too. Speak to me of history, a whispering, a reckoning. Thank you.